Rick taught psychology at Acadia University for 15 years, I believe. Yes. For 15 years and uh, was terminated recently. Uh, Rick's uh, talk today, the title is slightly different than, uh, he's going to uh, talk on the same topic but in a, uh, a, a, a narrower area of it. Canadian labour law, a threat to academic freedom. Join me in welcoming Rick Mehta. Okay, well uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, so what I'll be doing with my talk is going into the details of what happened in my case. I'm going to treat it as if it's a case report uh, to demonstrate the thesis that uh, our Canadian labour laws, uh, the way they're set up, are actually a threat to academic freedom. Uh, so I'll start a little bit about myself. So I started my career at Acadia University on July 1st, 2003. And so in terms of where my greatest uh, strength lied, lay was in the area of uh, teaching. Uh, so in terms of uh, what I was asked to do, what I was doing in my capacity as a professor, uh, was first I was teaching the Introductory Psychology 1 class, and I've been doing that every year since September 2006. So that's a class, depending on the section, anywhere between 150 to 250 people. Uh, so I did that every year except for the one year I was on sabbatical. Then in September 2010, uh, my department asked me to teach all of the department's required courses in the fall semester. So that was two sections of introductory psychology and one se section of research methods. So the range of students there could be in the range of 80 to 120, uh, depending on the given year. And so then in September 2012, that's when my teaching really started to hit its stride. And that was a mix of um, my personal development or spiritual development along with my professional development that uh, kind of aligned nicely at the same time. And so in terms of wh why, what I attribute my success to, I was a change of attitude. So one was before I used to think, you know, I'll come in, people re should respect my authority. And I uh, changed that to respect is a two-way street. And if I'm the authority figure, uh, then I should be giving it out in spades and don't worry about getting it in return. And the surprise I had was I got much more respect in return than I ever would have dreamt possible just by giving it. And then the second was how I went about doing my uh, presentation, my class content. So uh, much of how I taught um, was actually inspired by the Canadian, Rush band, the Canadian rock band Rush. So what they do is, uh, don't, yeah, it's serious, yeah, what they do is they make really complicated music accessible to the masses. And so that's what I was trying to do in the classroom is present very com compl uh, complicated, intricate material, but in a way that anyone on the street could come in and be part of the conversation. Okay, and then the other things that they do is, is a balance of competing principles. So have a serious message, but communicate it with joy. Uh, have um, something, yeah, uh, and the other is sort of uh, balance um, structure, uh, but also with the improvisation, so you can have a free, free flow of ideas. And then the other was the actual efforts I put in the classroom and outside of the classroom so that students could actually get feedback about what doing, they're doing correctly and incorrectly. And uh, as well, I made myself available for exams. Uh, so let's say if it's uh, an exam on a Monday night for the large course, I'd be available for a help session on the Sunday the night before so students could have that one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a space that wasn't my office or, of course, their personal space. And so in terms of evidence for this then, is uh, this table that I'll show. So in the first, the left-hand column is all the courses that I taught. The second semester is the, uh, what's been taught by all the other professors in the second term. And so the, uh, with, what's notable about mine is that the larger sample sizes, so partly due to the large classes, but also that when it came to doing the course evaluations, I would make sure I end 20 minutes early, explain why it is that they're doing the evaluations and that I'll actually use them for my personal professional development. And so then, in terms of um, evidence for competence, what we can just notice at the table is all of my numbers from the courses that I taught were consistently higher than the professors who taught the same, same types of courses in the second semester. And this last uh, line here is one that I'll expand on a little bit later. So why is there this sudden jump in those numbers? And so in terms of uh, recognition, uh, for the most part, uh, I always 
thought of myself as the one who's getting the sort of the good course evaluation, but not really the formal recognition. And that came in the 2016-2017 academic year where I, I was a recipient of two teaching awards. And so just as another example of being effective in my job is from this uh, table from our program review for my department and shows the number of co-op students uh, over the given years. And so you can notice there's a sudden jump. And so that's when 2014 I became the department's co-op rep. And at the same time there was a new co-op rep in the co-op office. And so we, made, we became a really good team in terms of working together. And I think that played a role then in the increase in the number of co-op students uh, that participated. And so then I thought, okay, I have a, I'm a reasonably well-respected member of the academic community. I thought then if I speak out about certain issues that people would listen to what I'd have to say, think about that, and reason would prevail. Uh, but I learned the hard way that that would not, not would happen. So instead, I was dismissed on August 31st, 2018. And so in terms of the justification, the context for that, uh, so if you look even on the SAF's website, uh, there's a, a letter by our president and he says, oh yeah, uh, it wasn't an academic freedom issue, it was because he, it was his conduct, but there's no uh, examples given, and it just talks about volume. So the pretext that was used was one was called a, the McKay Report, which is a third party investigation. Uh, so I was informed about that I was going to be investigated on February 13th, 2018, a letter from my vice president academic. And so the key thing to note about that is that our, you know, the, the system of laws that we use as professors, generally we work on the assumption that it's going to be our collective agreement. Uh, but there's nothing in the collective agreement that says that third party investigations can be a basis for discipline. And then the other report that was used was the Hooper report that was um, conducted by the Dean of Science at our institution. And so I did not know about uh, that he was doing an inquiry on my conduct in the classroom uh, until May 17, 2018. And so the key thing about that meeting was that it was held under the guise of the collective agreement, but to discuss uh, issues that were outside of the collective agreement. Uh, so he clearly was not following the collective agreement. And the union uh, president and the rep that was assigned didn't protest that in any way. So that, I think, demonstrates that they were uh, you know, condoning this. Okay. And so then you might wonder, well, how on these, based on these reports, could that be used as a basis for disciplining me? Uh, so that I found out on July 26th when Ron Pink, the union's lawyer, said, oh, well, we have this agreement for you and we're, see, we even have you separately and we're doing that specially for you. And this agreement waived all the rights and protections that I have as a tenure professor. And that's what allowed the... Um, the, the administration to discipline me. And so what we can see with uh, this picture here is we can see that it was signed by the president and our, of, the, of the university and of the union, but not by me. And um, in the eyes of labor law, this is actually a valid contract, as I would learned the hard way. Uh, so for our purposes, what I think, I think we can reasonably conclude is uh, that the two parties were on the same page, uh, but I was not. And so you might wonder, why would the union want to do this? What could be their possible motivations? And so I'll give uh, two possibilities. Uh, so one is by looking at dates. Uh, so on July 25th, 2017, I spoke out against my union during contract negotiations. And then that was followed, and that was during a union meeting. Then on August 1st, 2017, so a week later, I sent out an open letter to the university community in which I asserted that um, that the union is acting in bad faith, and I gave my uh, evidence and reasons for that. So now, almost one year to the date uh, that I speak out at the union meeting, uh, the union's lawyer now spends two hours trying to get me to sign that uh, process agreement, and one year to the date that I sent out the open letter, uh, the union president then signs it without my consent. So that's, I'd say, some circumstantial evidence, because the likelihood those days correspond by chance alone is rather slim. Uh, but I think this is what's the smoking gun that explains what the whole rationale was about. Uh, so last month, just by accident, I was searching on Google, and I came across this document uh, showing the minutes of the student union that took place on March 13th. And then under item 13E, update on investigation uh, on Rick Meta. I'm like, what is this about? So control F, Rick Meta. And so then I see this. 
Okay, so the president, of the, the president of the student union acknowledged that there was a controversy surrounding me, and she noted that there was a formal investigation opened by the university, so that's the uh, McKay report, and encouraged anyone who would like to have their voice heard be directed to her. And now this is the key, thing, key point. She stated that the university was looking at further options to support students who do not feel safe in the classroom. So I think there we have in writing that the university is coming to the safe space culture, and I was threatening that. Okay. And then next we have the, the uh, VP academic who now reiterated that students should feel safe in their classroom and explained that in addition to the McKay investigation, an investigation was being conducted under the collective agreement. So this is in March, but I had no idea about it that it was even starting until May. And a key thing about a collective agreement is it's between the Board of Governors and the Faculty Association. So I think that is kind of explains what this is, what the uh, what my dismissal was all about. Okay, uh, so uh, that's sort of the, the, the bird's eye view. So now I'll go into what sort of preceded, why would the investigation have happened and whatnot. Uh, so in terms of my career, I started in 2003. Uh, in 2006, a new colleague was hired, and then in 2009, there was a neuroscience um, option committee that was formed. And the rationale was that, well, there's been an increase in the enrollment for our neuroscience courses, so there's a demand, and so we should uh, satisfy that demand then by creating a neuroscience option. And so the point, the argument that I'll make is that that neuroscience option would not have been possible uh, without uh, my contributions. And so it's not me making this up, but that's actually from a letter from who's now the current head, Darlene Bader, when she was secretary uh, when I was uh, of my departmental review committee when I was going up for renewal. And so in this area, when they're valuing my, my teaching, it says, she wrote, yeah, in the area of teaching, it was noted that Dr. Mehta has performed at a high level consistently. Uh, this is evident in the strong course evaluations across a wide variety of courses, including courses that are required and much le and less less preferred by students. So that's the second half of research methods, second half of introductory psychology. Now next, it was also noted that course enrollments in physiological psychology have increased markedly since Dr. Mehta began teaching it. It's a testament to his ability to engage students in the classroom. Okay, so that is at least from my perspective, one contribution that I made to the department that was never uh, recognized. So now we can fast forward uh, to what I think is the um, sort of the top of the hierarchy within my department at this stage. Uh, so we have the department head. What's notable about her is she was uh, basically it's the neuroscience option committee is now also the top of the power, har power hierarchy. So with Darlene Bader, she was the noted as having a couch dedicated service award. And the reason that's given was I'm telling you you could have not asked for a more courageous defender of equity. And that, of course, I think we know means equality of uh, outcomes as opposed to equality of opportunity. And then from the program review that, was that we did in 2017, so in that document, so we know that she's department head. And what she's noted with uh, pride then is that she's had several leadership roles within the union. So that includes the senior grievance officer, being on the negotiating team, and being president. So I think from there what that can tell us is she has a really good working knowledge of the contract and how to get around loopholes and whatnot. So then second is an instructor in our department, uh, Carmen Bliley. So she too, by chance, also has a COUT Dedicated Service Award that she received in December 2013, although there the reasons weren't given. Oops. And so now if we look at her program review, uh, she too also has extensive service with the union. And so interestingly, the word equity comes up here, the uh, employment equity, appointments, and also junior grievance officer. So again, has a good working knowledge of the contract. Okay. And then the new hire who I mentioned, who started in 2006, that's uh, Randy Lynn Newman. Uh, what's interesting about her is after my dismissal, uh, there, the fundraising campaign was started to raise fundraise $12.5 million. And she's a poster child for that, uh, holding a model of the human brain. And she's there noted for having exceptional teaching and engagement. So from the, uh, thought, okay, I thought, okay, let's look at her teaching. Uh, so from the program review, and I looked under teaching awards, and she notes that she had an Acadia Student Union Teaching Leadership Award in 2017. 
And that seemed rather odd to me because I won an award I wore that year. I was at the, um, at the reception that was held and I don't recall seeing her there at all. I don't recall seeing her name on any documents and there were no emails or anything like that sent around. So that seemed a little odd to me. Maybe it's a brain fart, but something else seemed a little suspicious, uh, which was that um, in 2016, she was a recipient of an Associate Alumni of Acadia University Distinguished Faculty Award. Uh, so this was in 2016, but in the summer of 2017, I had to give a reminder to the department head that she's listing it as having been received in 2016, and that should really be 2017, when it should really be 2016. So uh, an interesting tidbit for those who might be interested on why I remember that particular uh, convocation so well, is that she wasn't the only person who won an, a major award. So another person was uh, an alumni from Acadia uh, who won a um, honorary doctorate, and that person happened to be uh, Deborah McClatchy at Laurier University. Okay, uh, so now we look at the service, and we can see a lot having to do with the equity committees, women in science and engineering, gender studies, the union, the, the women's committee. So that basically describes the, the top of the power hierarchy in my department. And so in terms of my career, I'll give acknowledgement that there were actually two really good years, the, probably the two years where I actually felt like I was a valued member of my department. And that was when Diane Holmberg was acting head. Uh, so when it came to my career development, she said, with teaching, you are definitely now at the level of full professor. What you're doing is definitely distinct. On the research side, yeah, you're more at the level of associate because you have a lot of poster and oral presentations. It would be nice if you had more uh, peer-reviewed publications. And on the service side, yeah, you're a valued member of the, of the university. You contribute. You definitely do more than enough to pull your own weight. So those are the two probably best years of my career at uh, Acadia. Uh, but that then all changed in the, the next academic years when Sonia Major became head. So I made the mistake of talking to her and I said, I find it a bit, you know, when I go to the lunchroom, I find it uncomfortable uh, when I have the colleagues um, talking ways that make me uncomfortable as a male. And so I gave the example of the uh, one colleague who referred to the kinesiology department as a sausage fest because it's male dominated. And I said, well, how can you expect a respectful workplace when you uh, treat males that way? Uh, turned out she was not happy about me making that complaint, and that got reflected then in my career development letter. So basically the way it was structured is, uh, first parts are just statements of fact, and then you go into the interpretation. Uh, so instead of being along the lines of a valued colleague, it was, uh, student comments indicate pr that students perceive you as someone who really cares about their learning and tries very hard to help students learn concepts. So I interpret more as like a backhanded compliment or minimizing my accomplishments. Now the next is, of course, I think we all know we're going to get complaints about our marking. I think that's we get across the board. So her comment about that was, there were some comments that indicated some concerns about how midterm exams are graded. We discussed ways in which you could consider how to help build a little more flexibility into your grading schemes to account for students' different ways of expressing themselves. Uh, so in that year, she was in a position of strength. I couldn't really do much. If I tried to um, respond, I would have been one who comes across as unreasonable or whining or something like that. So instead, what I did was I just waited patiently. And then the following year, I was far more prepared. And I went in with written documents saying, I, I, you know, I think my performance at the level of a full professor, and I want that to be recognized. And that took her by surprise. Her meeting lasted, I think, only 20 minutes with her just saying the whole time, how can you be so defensive? And so then, uh, when I got my letter, it was interesting. So in terms of the main sentence to look at now is now it got changed to, the only negative comments that came from several students is that they perceive your grading as being too precise, uh, whatever that means. When I discussed that with you, you said you were unwilling to change this aspect of your testing. Uh, so the mistake she made there was that she implied that I had a deficiency that was getting worse, and this was the year I had the best course evaluations of my entire career. And so it was easy to prove that to be false. So when it comes to managerial rights, uh, they have the right to misrepresent you if they like. They can kind of stretch the truth a bit. But the one thing they can't actually do is say something that's demonstrably false. 
Uh, so I gave that to her. It wasn't meant to be an act of cruelty. It was because it was nervousness on my part. I hated the thought of doing this. Uh, but I gave that letter to her on June 30th of 2016. And it was her last day before going on sabbatical and then retiring, which I don't think she was too happy about either. So I thought once that's done, I'll, I'll be having a room to breathe and my career will grow. But then in the 2016-2017 academic year, a lot of strange things then started to happen. Uh, so first uh, was that uh, Darlene Bader was uh, both a union president and head, and so therefore wasn't teaching anything at all. And meanwhile, there was the Jordan Peterson stand against Bill C-16. And I thought, wait a minute, why isn't she saying or doing anything? I'm expecting her to be in the leadership position here. So you just think, oh, if someone else in psychology, let's defend their academic freedom. Or as union presidents, let's try to defend their academic freedom. So then that made me start to wonder, well, where is the CAUT? Uh, where is the Canadian Psychological Association? Where is the Canadian Society for Brain, Behavior, and Cognitive Science? So that made me start thinking something's amiss. And I started to then, it made me start to figure out what is going on. And then we f in March 27, 2017, I wrote a letter then to our presidential search committee about our presidential candidate, Peter Ricketts, uh, because in his talk, he specifically said that he wanted to commit the university to social justice. And the alarm bells went in my head. How could, if we commit to ourselves to a political ideology, by definition, then we're going to shout out other points of view, and that has implications for free speech. Uh, but that letter was to no avail. Uh, so when I look at my career development uh, writer and the report, when we had our meeting, it just felt stilted. And so she would say, well, what else do I need to include in your letter? So it wasn't that sense of uh, celebrating your accomplishments. And so then in terms of little telltale signs, is all my previous years, I was always addressed as Dear Rick. Now here I'm addressed as Dear Dr. Meta. So that's uh, that something's not right. Uh, there was sort of the style that sounds very stilted in terms of how she recognized my accomplishments. Uh, but the telltale sign is not by acts of commission, but omission. So there was never, she never made any announcement about my wars at any department meetings. There was no email sent out or anything like that. And so then July 25th, 2017 is when I spoke out at the union meeting. Uh, so after I did that, I started getting emails from one of my colleagues about the website and how there needed to be these updates. And these are on really nitpicky things that I thought no one there no reasonable person would think to bring up. But the big one that came up that really sent a uh, chill down my spine uh, was this email that I s received. So again, the context is uh, she had, the last time I saw her was uh, June 30th, 2016. It's been over a year since I last saw her in any meaningful way, and she's retired. And then she sends this email message out of the blue. Hi, Rick, Heather's still listed as the contact person here, so that should probably change as well. So where did this as well come from? And it's a really nitpicky step too in terms of where that was on the web page. Because so that really was setting a lot of alarm bells. And so to fight back, I sent out then the open letter that I'd been working on for a week, uh, hoping that would get everyone to back off. Okay. Uh, instead, uh, it changed the dynamic in my department altogether. So I won't go through the whole email, but this is one I'd received from Diane Holmberg, who uh, before that was very supportive. And so the part that I found interesting is um, this uh, sentence here. Yeah, now to, uh, does it work? You know. Now to make matters even worse, the equity officer has publicly weighed in with a promise to protect you against potential, in quotations, harassment as discrimination, as if that's a bad thing to be protected from that. Uh, but so what I'll just note here is that our equity officer, Meg Townsend, ended up eventually resigning over the university's handling my case. And both of the grievance officers that were working with me end up uh, not being union officers. Uh, so in terms of, whoops. So that basically was the start of the change of the dynamic in my department. And I think everyone thought that I would just quiet down, I'd be under control. But instead, I did the opposite. So September 27th, 2017, I gave a, you know, an almost two-hour talk on free speech in universities. And uh, that was followed then by uh, various emails to me that were not very friendly. So one was by Eva Curry, someone in the math and stats department, where she put in a public forum that that was the worst, something along the lines like, that was the worst violation of academic integrity I've ever seen in my life. 
And that was easy for me to also disprove in an uh, open forum. So I just said, oh, well, your first point is that I had no references, uh, but I actually circulated a document that contained 20 pages of references. So have a nice day. And um, if you want to see more of her, what uh, she's like, um, if you go to the one hour, eight minute mark on the panel discussion, uh, you can judge for herself how she, um, the kind of arguments and the clarity which she articulates her arguments against uh, free speech. Okay, so another one that I received then was from Cynthia Bruce, who's in education and is now the current union, union president. So what's interesting here in this email is that it wasn't just sent to me, but it was copied on a dean and my colleague who's in the, all the women's committees and whatnot. And so eventually what I learned from Howard Levitt, the employment lawyer, is that uh, if someone copies a, a superior, that's their way of saying discipline him. So that's something I did not know at the time. And so in terms of things she um, accused me of without any uh, evidence then, uh, was that I had stances that were disturbing, uh, that I was dangerously close to advocating oppression, uh, that I'm working to silence marginalized voices, and that I'm advancing human rights violations. And from members who've seen my talk, uh, they know that's further thing from the truth. And so we can fast forward now to November. Uh, so after the talk, so I was just having on Facebook a discussion with a student. And so this is part of a larger thread. And so at this point, I was getting a bit frustrated to him. And so then I said, if you think that the research uh, that's on the New Real Peer Review Twitter page wouldn't take place at Acadia, then check out the following link and explain to me how this award-winning thesis can be used as an endorsement for the arts or for a counseling degree from an education program. And so when you look at the link, what it's for is an award-winning thesis. Whoops. Uh, here, where Tyler received this award for his thesis title, An Auto-Ethnographic -ethnogra Exploration of My Sexual Identity as Seen Through Interpretive Dance. <laughs> okay. The researchers commented on the depth of Tyler's writing and how he used dance as integral, integral to the research, not just as an add-on. Uh, so I got a, shortly after that, I got a visit from the Dean of Science, Jeff Hooper, and he asked me to take that down. I said, why? He said, well, when you're doing that by posting a link that way, you're ridiculing the students coming out experience, and then that could be perceived as violating our harassment uh, and discrimination policy on the basis of homophobia. And so I said to him, well, change the policy then. It's not my fault. That's a policy. And he wasn't happy about that. Uh, so immediately after he left his office, what I did to create a record was I went onto Twitter and that led to him eventually sending this email to me. Uh, again, now what's interesting is he's copying it on uh, the vice president academic, so another superior saying, okay, disciplining him. Uh, but what led to his undoing though was this one sentence. So during our meeting, I repeatedly stated that I recommended that you take, consider taking this post down. I never directly asked you to take it down. In fact, I went further and informed you that it was, I was not in a position to ask you to, to take this down. It was simply my recommendation. Uh, so in terms of his undoing, I read this sentence back to him in a discipline meeting I had on August uh, 22nd. And after that, there's little to no mention of him or his report afterwards. Okay, uh, so then in December 2017, on the 13th, um, I sent out an email to, our, uh, to a public forum in which I criticized an article that was in the student newspaper about the so-called gender inequities in academic hiring and gave fault, you know, facts to the contrary. Uh, so then I got a an email from a colleague, uh, copied now to the vice president academic, and there she says, uh, because the vice president academic is ultimately has a responsibility for the student's well-being. This is something that always irked me, so I have to just get that out of my system, the, because it's 2015 as her signature. Okay. Uh, and then here, in terms of why, what was the reason for the complaint? So she said, you could have easily made your points about women in science without naming the student, so the author of the article, or even referring to the article itself. Uh, so it's just, yeah, I just thought that's absolutely ridiculous. And so when she said, um, uh, if you want to have a discussion, I'd be more than happy to. So I said, yeah, let's talk about funding cuts to WISE. Okay. And so I don't think she was happy about that. Uh, then over the Christmas break, I put a post in which I was critical of the Me Too movement. And a student then, who's going to be in my uh, January semester, 
uh, was not happy about that, Veronica Oliver. And so then she posted some uh, links then to uh, gender studies talking about rape culture. And so I tried to give her other points of view. Uh, you know, so the, the campus rape crisis uh, video from Diana Davison, uh, a video by a presentation by Wendy McElroy. Uh, but she would listen to any of that, and so I was point blank to her saying that your line of thinking is that of an ideologue, not that of a reasonable person. And so when I saw the McKay report, I saw that she put in complaints, I want out of his class, and for whatever reason, they didn't accommodate her request. Uh, at the start of the new year in 2018, I sent out uh, an email message um, uh, expressing my concerns about the university's decolonization, especially for academic freedom. So if you have the compelled speech in the form of those land acknowledgments. Uh, so the response I got from the Dean of Arts, Jeff, Jeff Hennessy, is one that would have gotten him fired if that same type of exchange had happened in the private workforce. And this is an article that was written by Howard Levitt. Uh, so what's interesting about that exchange is it was one about academic freedom and there was no responses from any of the uh, union representatives. And so then in terms of where the decision was made where we're probably going to get rid of him, I think it was on this day here. Uh, so a tweet that I'd sent to opposition leader Andrew Scheer about his removal of Senator Bayak uh, from the Conservative Caucus that first made headlines um, in Nova Scotia and then across the country. And on that day, I could just sense a work, a change in the work environment and had that sense of, okay, this is it, we've had enough, we're going to do whatever we can to get rid of him. So the first thing that happened was I lost the courses uh, that I taught for years and actually very well. So it was interesting to know who actually got my courses. So for the introductory psychology one, they decided to assign it then to someone we hadn't even interviewed, so we don't even know who the new hire is, but we're going to give the course to him. Uh, my research methods course was given to Randy Newman, who also teaches uh, research methods too. So her numbers, I think, are not in the 2012-2013 academic year, but they're reflected in all the other years. And so what's unique about that last year, and why I asked you to look at the 2016-27 year, is that with that one year is where there's going to be only two instructors in, for there versus... Um, uh, where it could be three, so you can narrow down your possibilities. So we know that Randy Newman was teaching, most of the time, uh, research methods. Uh, but what happened in the 2016-2017 academic year was that there was a change in instructor. So that was the one year that Doug Simmons is not teaching the course. And we noticed that there's this huge increase in the ratings on all the different items, like overall instructor rating, course, test fairness, etc. Uh, so as I was starting the course, I thought around January 2017 uh, that I'm going to start uh, recording my classes and the plan was that I'd post them on YouTube with my slides so it'd be of something that would be acknowledged, you know, uh, available to the general public. And I was doing it for that person, but I was glad I did because now I had a record of some of the strange things that were going on in the classes. So uh, topics that previously would have been completely non-controversial were suddenly controversial. So on the 17th and 19th of January, I was going in the section of um, um, the topic of intelligence. And so I talked about sex differences in intelligence and how those could then have implications for career choices and then therefore differences in wages. I also talked about how differences in wages amongst ethnic groups could be explained by economics by using a Thomas Sewell video as opposed to what we always hear, stereotype threat and implicit bias. And so the types of reactions were just something I could not comprehend. It was, it, was, it was only a small group, a small cabal, but they were very vocal. And I could see the other students just looking absolutely petrified, like, what do I do? And many of them come afterwards as, I don't know what's going on. All you're trying to do is get us to think and think critically, so I don't understand the reaction. And so in terms of next change, then, is on January 19th, uh, this person, Robert Rayside, was now assigned as my designated head. Um, the reason that he's worth mentioning is that he had gone against me when he was dean and he was one who was opposed to me even having tenure. And so he was assigned because he, in quotes, has administrative experience. Okay. Uh, February 6th, uh, the Anne Kama, the, the coordinator of our women and gender studies, sends an email out in a public forum where the concluding sentence is, women's and gender studies stands in solidarity with all those who continue to teach and speak out in university, an increasingly chilly climate where boundaries of academic freedom are marked at the intersection of so-called freedom of speech. I have no idea what that means, but I was pretty sure it was directed to me given that I was the only person at the university who was openly advocating for free speech. 
And that happened to be sent just a couple of days before I was doing a class in the topic of human development. And there I was presenting evidence that was critical of the role of feminism in our education system. So there was one video by Christina Hoff Summers, another with a video of, from the Independent Women's Forum where it was a discussion between Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia. And so then the student, Veronica Oliver, who is already uh, having um, a vendetta against me, uh, then started screaming out that by showing that video, I was somehow condoning rape. And then that was then followed then a few days later then by the letter of investigation I received by my vice president academic saying that she was justifying the investigation on legal grounds. So the university has a legal responsibility to provide an, ar argu a, an argument that's free now from sexual harassment. So I strongly suspected that the sexual harassment was in reference then to the exchange that had taken place in the class a few days earlier. And what's noteworthy is the kind of language here. So the nature and frequency of the complaints and the significance of allegations is the basis now for the internal investigation or by this so-called third party. And here then I have a promise of some very high standards. So here I was promised that the university would be sensitive to issues such as due process. As well, in the last sentence there, she makes mention to a methodology. And so I thought, okay, this, there's some promise then that this is going to be something other than just a hired gun doing a hit piece on me, or at least, at least implies that. Uh, but I didn't like the idea of staying silent about this. Uh, so what I just did was I bided my time, waited until reading week was over, and then on the Sunday before classes started, I released it to the press, and it actually then made headlines, and people across the country who were paying attention then knew that I was being investigated by Wayne McKay. So just for context then, what was happening in the background that I didn't know about then was the Acadia Students' Union encouraging people to uh, come forward. Uh, so in terms of the big faux pas, which I think they wanted to use against me as this is the thing that makes us show that he's just this absolutely horrible person, uh, was this one complaint that was received on April 11th. And so this was by a student, Callie Keating. So, oops, darn it. Okay. So what's of note here is that she says, I'm f submitting a formal complaint against Dr. Mehta. So key point then, this is not the first formal complaint I've filed. Furthermore, all of my previous formal complaints have gone and answered. And so I did ask the question, so what's so special about this complaint that's worth uh, looking into, but not all of the other ones? Okay, and so then what is she upset about? And so then here she says then, uh, during the honors thesis conference, uh, Dr. Mehta exhibited extremely inappropriate behavior during my presentation, but not the presentation of the other students in our department. Seems a bit odd for wording, but, um, so in terms of how that's partly true, so yes, during her presentation, I did uh, roll my eyes, and there are a couple of points, things were just so, it was like an emperor has no clothes kind of moment, so that's what's got made me giggle uh, to myself quietly. Uh, so that part's true. The part that's false is that I didn't just do that in her presentation. I actually did do that for other presentations as well. <laughs> and well, it's, that day, that honors conference, uh, those are some of the worst presentations I had seen. I was just appalled and I was uh, you know, embarrassed to actually be a member of the department that day. So there were a lot of cringeworthy uh, presentations. So it was not unique to just her. So in terms of why, why would I do that? So we just look at the title of her thesis. So its title is, The Impact of Intensive Short-Term STEAM Engagement on Girls' Self-Efficacy, uh, Belongingness, and Career Aspirations. So just by the title alone, it implies in causation when it's a correlation. So you can't use a word like impact or effectiveness uh, when there's no, when people aren't assigned, randomly assigned to conditions. And this is something she should have known because she's taken three courses with me, including research methods. So that's why uh, I was rolling my eyes and why I was frustrated that day. But the telltale sign is that the dean had sent this uh, copy of this um, complaint to me uh, without thinking first. And so then I saw a message that I don't think I was meant to see, uh, which was an email sent then in response to that by our, my department head uh, to everyone else. So hello all. In response to Callie's email, I want to say that this situation was 100% predictable and I continue to be frustrated that Rick Mehta has been left in a position of authority over students for many months as things have continued to escalate. 
We know what the risks and consequences are for students, and I personally have expressed them on numerous occasions, and yet nothing has been done to minimize the impact of the situation while formal channels are being pursued. So that was one I don't think was meant to be seen by me or for the public, but I think that is sort of the gives an idea of what's happening behind the scenes. I'd be, I would love to be able to see the email exchanges. Uh, okay, we've got a few, yeah, I'll try to do what I can. Uh, we did start late. On uh, April 23rd, I met with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Wayne McKay. Oops. And I gave my 13 major response and he submitted his report. So now we uh, fast forward to July where Ron Pink asked me to sign this agreement. So what was in that? So, uh, so what is it that unions could do um, with that, with, with, uh, no, without impunity? So first was it changed the framework. So was, the idea was that I'm gonna have a one day meeting. Uh, we discuss uh, whatever I'd done and there could be, this, uh, and maybe or maybe if there not, uh, there would be uh, discipline. So first was that the McCain investigation was justified on legal grounds and on the basis of the seriousness of the complaints and now it's been changed to a variety of complaints if you look at the first uh, whereas. Another principle when it comes to um, uh, collective agreements is that members of the bargaining unit can't grieve against the um, um, members in the same unit, but here now there's an exception being made for me. Uh, the third bullet, the third whereas, uh, there's no references to a me methodology, nothing about due process, being fair, reasonable, or impartial, so it talks about volume or being extensive. Uh, and the fourth whereas, th they're actually relying on anonymous material, so names are just redacted, and people decide after the fact if they wanted their names to be shown. Okay, and so in terms of this, this was the first time I was informed that there was actually a report written about me by Jeff Hooper. And then on page two, the, um, it specifically says, we want to expedite all issues real pertaining to me. And that, of course, goes against uh, the idea of due process. Okay, so then the idea was there was going to be our, the report, and we discussed them. But the only way I could get copies, my own copies of the report, was if I agreed to be gagged. And that's, that, that's what this 10th uh, uh, premise says. So I wouldn't talk to anyone or any third party unless I was authorized by the university. And so you might wonder, okay, well, what was actually in the report? Who are the complainants? So this should probably not be any surprise then. These are all, it was pretty much everyone in my department. Uh, there was one person who chose to have his name redacted here, but I looked at his transcript with Wayne McKay in the Hooper report, and there his name was not redacted. I didn't know why that is, uh, but that person happened to be Doug Simmons. Okay, and then in terms of uh, other complainants from other departments, as we can see, the gender studies, there are probably no surprises here. Uh, so just in terms of Lynn Aylward, she's in education. She's a, she, she, she argues that students all learn in different ways. So the way to address that is by getting all faculty to use a technique called universal instructional design, which I see as a threat to academic freedom. Uh, there's one person whose name was redacted, but when reading the context and putting context, I'm pretty sure it was Glenn, Glennis Gibson from WISE. And then in terms of student complainants, no surprises here, these are the ones that are probably the most notable. Uh, the one I didn't mention, and I'll just say in passing, was the editor-in-chief of the student newspaper, who also behind the scene was launching petitions to have me dismissed. So of course, no uh, bias there. So on uh, August 22nd, I had the meeting with the vice president academic to discuss the letter that was dated August 2nd uh, about discipline. Uh, what I think was interesting about that meeting was that uh, even though the decision was already made, she had the power, was that she kept losing uh, composure through that, throughout that meeting. So I thought that was something that was noteworthy. And I mentioned with Jeff Hooper and how his report then, uh, there was a little mention of that afterwards. And not surprisingly, a few hours after the meeting, uh, there was, I was told the recommendation was gonna be dismissal with the meeting scheduled for August 31st. Uh, when I went to the meeting at that point, I, you know, I decided to stand my ground and I just said, uh, I think this is just all about uh, you guys not uh, tolerating voices of dissent. And so if you're going to dismiss me, just go ahead and do it. That was the general tone. And I think that threw them off guard. So they just said, okay, we'll postpone the meeting for a few hours, come back. And so then I was given the dismissal letter. 
uh, which I think some of you might have seen online. So the key point is the collective agreement is very specific about saying that you have to mention in specific reasons. And it's very vague. It just talks about extensive volume and how you didn't fail to correct your conduct, that kind of thing. So it basically, the dismissal letter didn't go in line with the stipulations of our collective agreement. So after you get dismissed from a unionized workforce, uh, there's actually minimal recourse then for, uh, for most faculty members because the majority of Canadian universities are unionized. Uh, so the reason for that is there's the Weber versus Ontario Hydro Supreme Court ruling, and that prevents us as employees from having any kind of legal recourse against our employer. Okay, so that by definition means that you have to work with your union. So I, th I put in a complaint to the Labour Board uh, under the duty of fair representation. So what's interesting is the response that I get, and it's a pretty standard form letter response saying that the union is in full control of the grievance. I, as a member, have no control whatsoever. Uh, that the union must place priority on the interests of the bargaining union as a whole when they try to deal and resolve ish, uh, grievances. And then the fourth point, uh, when the interests of the bargaining unit conflict with the interests of an individual member, the union must act in the interest of the bargaining unit. Uh, however, there's no stipulation for them to provide any evidence that this is the rationale for doing so. It's, so it basically is based on what the executive decides when they're having their meetings. And so the success rate for these duty of fair representation complaints is very, it's almost non-existent. So 1% at the national level and 0% uh, within Nova Scotia. And that I got from a Freedom of Information request that uh, a friend of mine, Shannon Nickerson, did in uh, so basically, in her case, uh, she was working as a part-time faculty member at St. Mary's University in the psychology department and was dismissed for having brain surgery. Uh, so basically, your choice then is working with your union under the situation. And that is probably one of the most frustrating things. So I asked about due process in that sentence earlier, and Pink's like, oh, well, what that means is we fire you, and then afterwards, and you go to arbitration. That's when your due process means. So don't worry about that during the investigation part. So in terms of your options then is arbitration. So the arbitrator, had it gone that route, would have been William Kaplan at the bottom left. And so the key things about the arbitrators is that they're hired to resolve a so-called dispute between the administration and the union. And it's not really much of a dispute when both parties are on the same page. So the counsel that was there then was Ron Pink for my union and Peter Barnacle for Kout. And so if I wanted to go the arbitration route, these are the things I would have agreed to. The McKay report actually now being entered as fact, and I would be arguing against it, so I couldn't argue about methodology or anything like that. Uh, the hearing would be behind closed doors with a big egg order in effect. I'd be going into a hearing without a lawyer representing me. And there was obvious conflict of interest being ignored, so Pink was just really, he was just in my face and just uh, gloating about how he was the lawyer that had given uh, McKay um, legal advice when McKay was president of Mount Allison University and how McK McKay had worked in Pink's firm earlier in his career. I would be required to disclose any, in quotes, arguably relevant documents to the administration without any documents being released to me. Uh, I'd have to give uh, recordings that I had to the administration, he said, and don't go home and delete them because we'll know about it, which I have no idea what that meant. And then, well, this is the part I found disturbing, so when it comes to emails and privacy, the employer can't access our emails, uh, but I would have to agree to giving the union lawyer access to all the emails that I sent and received between July 1st, 2017, and my dismissal, and there was no justification for why this, why, you know, why I would have to do this. Uh, so I ended up doing what no one expected me to do, which was I walked out of the meeting, and then I sent a letter to the president just saying, these are the terms if you want me to settle this right now. Uh, the most important for me having something in writing, a written letter from you explaining why it is that I was dismissed. So then we uh, had a mediated settlement meeting on April 1st, uh, in terms of stars aligning in ways that can be humorous. Yeah, it was that it aligned, the days happen aligned for April Fool's Day. <laughs> which gave me some giggles. And so in terms of when it comes to something outside of uh, labor law, as then we kind of agree that a good settlement is one where neither party is a clear winner or a clear loser. So each gets something they want, but not something else. So from that perspective, that was a perspective I went going into this uh, settlement. Uh, so in my view, I thought we had a really good, um, uh, a good settlement. 
So unfortunately, though, the terms are confidential, and that never made any sense to me because you have the Ontario, Weber versus Ontario ruling hydro, that protects the um, Acadia. You have the low success rates for the duty of fair representation complaints that protects the union. And in my case, too, I'm also going through a divorce proceeding, and as part of that, I have to give full financial disclosure. So it's likely that I'll have to give that document there where it's going to be available to the general public anyways, just when it's available in family court. So for those reasons, I'm not sure why then they're insisting this must be confidential. Uh, but basically what's happened in the last few days is that I got an email from the union's, the university's lawyer, and of course that's from the president indirectly. Uh, saying that I breached confidentiality because I described myself as a vindicated former professor on my Twitter profile. And so now they're trying to weasel their way out of giving me the severance that I would be due in a wrongful dismissal case. And so in terms of the message I've seen, received from Kaplan, it seems like he seems to be buying this argument, even though I'm pretty sure he knows that settlements are typically reached in these public service workplaces when there's an employer uh, terminates uh, an employee's um, uh, employment without cause. And so it makes me feel all the more that he's hypocritical because he's written a book called Why Dissent Matters. And here it's a clear case where I was a voice of dissent and uh, he seems to be oblivious to that. Uh, so in terms of my basic response of where the things are heading now is because I'm a big fan of music. So instead of closing with Rush, I thought I'd close with song by Don Henley, which he did with uh, Axl Rose, just saying, I will not go quietly. Okay, thank you. Questions, questions for Rick then. William, did you have one? I have a question for uh, Bruce. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that really concerns me is that the union is just equally infiltrated with the ideas that the, the that the school believes in. So there's no defense of dissenting. Like there will be no dissent for professors, and I don't see how you can convince the union to 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 take your side in this. You know what I mean? Like yeah, what, no, this has no recourse. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, 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 that is the main point. I'm glad that that is coming across, just that, yeah, when you have to work with your union, they have their own interests that are different from yours, and they're very explicit in saying, yeah, we're here to represent our interests, not yours. You're completely helpless. Uh, but, yeah, I've just uh, been trying to resist as, uh, as, you know, as quietly as I can and just let people know and just get the word out there. And I think that's all you can do is, uh, I think, as Peter Wissin would say, put your thoughts out there and just see what happens. And my own view is always do what you believe to be right as opposed to do what you believe to be easy. Question? Eva. Eva. Um, I would very much like to hear uh, Bruce Party's view of opinion on this talk, please. <laughs> is, do, do, uh, do, do you wish to answer that question, Bruce? Uh, a, a question for, uh, for Rick. No, I, 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 <laughs> I think the main point that Rick is making is, is correct, which is that because of the way the labor law system is set up and the way it works at universities, you, you, you are very much beholden to their support uh, when you're running into, into trouble. So if you already have an antagonistic relationship with them, then you're really exposed, whether you have tenure or not. Ten ten the, the protection of tenure is dependent upon your union protecting it. And so there has to be, in order for the union to protect you when they don't like you, there has to be enough of a threat in systemic terms to the whole idea that the university can willy-nilly dismiss somebody who has, who has tenure. If you don't have that dynamic there, then you are exposed. Yeah, so that point, that was one thing that was uh, raised to me repeatedly, uh, let's say by Ron Pink, saying, yeah, your colleagues don't like you. And I thought, well, there's nothing in the collective agreement saying that there's a requirement that my colleagues like me. And now suddenly there's this new set of rules I was never made, um, that was never brought to my attention in the past. Heinz, and then uh, Grant. You gave much, a great importance to the teaching evaluations, uh, to those marks. Um, I wonder how strong your case would be without even mentioning them. I have personally no respect for those teaching evaluations. 
unless those numbers are accompanied by the average marks that you give in the class. So I think these teaching evaluation marks, they are worthless. But how strong would your case be without all of those? Well, um, I per yeah, the reason I presented those, I think with the course evaluations, it all depends on how they're used. And so I made sure that students knew that I was taking them seriously. And so I think that was reflective in how much time they put into them, the kinds of comments that I received that, by and large, were quite um, thoughtful and reflective. So I think part of it is how it's done, uh, doing it in class versus online. So th those are some of the factors. And the other factor is how uh, department heads look at the comments and the numbers, because that's where the other form of distortion happens. Uh, so in terms of recently, there was a ruling actually by William Kapla, Kaplan in uh, the Ryerson versus their faculty association, and he actually ruled that um, the course evaluations can't be used for things like tenure and promotion. But uh, the rationale the faculty association there is giving is that these things are biased. So instead, we'll have the professors talk about things like their teaching philosophies and their views because somehow that's not going to be biased. So it's replacing one bad system with something that's far worse. So I think it's better to have the course evaluations use them uh, judiciously and put them in a proper context. So I prefer to use those because those are based on all comments from my class because I could have used you know, what people said about beyond spotted at Acadia, but that's a very biased sample. So that's why I use that some way of something that's, a, that's subjective while, of course, we acknowledge their... Um, uh, their limitations, but I also did explain why I thought I was having the, the high numbers so that I wasn't pandering to students and anything, the low grades that I was giving, that was really the only complaint was why that it's too harsh. You, why don't you give the, the marks, the average marks? Oh, I could do that. Yeah, my marks were always in... There was nothing here. Okay, I didn't think to bring that uh, here, but uh, they were always in the sort of this, the 70-ish range. I, I did not believe in grade inflation. I would not pander to students. So that was what I, what I was trying to do is show that if you put enough care and effort into your teaching, you can have the academic rigor and still have people respect you as long as you're explaining what you're doing. And that's what I was trying to do. We'll give Grant the last uh, question of this session, and then we'll go to lunch just down the hall. More of an observation than a question. Uh, when I was at the University of Lethbridge, there seemed to be a pattern whereby the union president if they were willing to play ball with the administration in their annual negotiations for this, that, and the other thing, if they seemed to be kind of sympathetic with the administration's point of view, they would eventually get promoted to like VP academic or dean or you know some kind of administrative position. If they were hostile to the administration and took, took a more adversarial role, then they would get shoved back into the regular professoriate and they, their career prospects would be dampened. And so there was again this this kind of collusion going on, the informal collusion, which you know, it, it's only an impression. You can't prove it in any kind of yeah, no, that, well, I guess that was the, the type of point that I was trying to make and what I purposely did here was try to just lay out the facts and keep the interpretation to a minimum and just let, uh, you know, let that go in the court of public opinion because my view is you know, generally people are intelligent. If you treat them that way, uh, they will then rise to, um, rise to that level of discourse. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, thank you.